Hi, my name's Jill, and I'm here to walk you through your total joint replacement procedure. We're going to talk about the risks and benefits of the procedure, as well as how to prepare yourself for the upcoming surgery, what the time in the hospital will be like, and what recovery should look like. After this, hopefully your questions will be answered and you'll feel better about the surgery in general. The first thing I want to tell you is that you're in good hands with us at TriStar Hendersonville Medical Center for your hip replacement or your knee replacement. Just this past year, we achieved a specialty certification from the Joint Commission for caring for our total hip and total knee replacement patients. What this means is an outside person came into our facility, interviewed our patients, interviewed our physicians, our nurses, our therapists, dug into our quality data and our patient records, and we earned this gold seal of approval after that process. That just means that we go above and beyond in the care of our total hip and total knee replacement patients. I have um, an implant or an example of a total knee implant with me today. Your procedure will begin with an incision down the front of your knee. Once the surgeon has exposed the ends of your bones, he will start to make some cuts or prepare the end of the bone. This is your femur or your thigh bone and all of our bones are, are hollow tubes. In this portion of the bone, your surgeon will make some cuts um, to prepare for this piece. They'll drill little holes here. They will mix bone cement in the operating room and then uh, put the bone cement around these peg holes and then tap this piece in place at the end of your femur. The implants are made of metal alloys. That means a combination of metals, mostly titanium. You will be able to have imaging studies done. Your doctor can still order a CT scan or an MRI or an X-ray of your body, even though you have these metal implants in place. This bottom portion is your tibia or your shin bone. So your surgeon will prepare this part of the bone and drill a little bit of space inside the, the top of the shin bone. The bone cement will be pressed around this stem piece and this will be tapped in place. In between these metal components is a polyethylene. It's a fancy piece of plastic, highly heated, and this will become the new shock absorber. The shock absorber we were born with is called a meniscus and it's a horseshoe shaped piece that sits in between our bones. That piece is removed during the surgery and this plastic piece acts as your new meniscus. The ligaments that you were born with on the sides of your knees will remain just as they are today. The surgeons are only working on this surface of your knee. There's one piece of the model that I don't have to demonstrate. Your kneecap or your patella sits about right here in the knee and it moves up and down slightly as your knee bends and straightens. Your surgeon will expose the back of your kneecap and tap a little plastic button on the back of your kneecap and put it back in place. So you will leave with the kneecap you came in with just with an extra plastic piece on the back of it. But the top of your kneecap will feel just like it does today. Then your incision will be closed and you will wake up in the recovery room. I have a hip replacement model as well. If you are having a hip replacement, your incision can be in a couple different places. The incision on the front is called an anterior hip replacement and the incision on the back is called a posterior hip replacement. The implant is the same no matter where the incision is. It's just a matter of which way your surgeon prefers to expose the hip joint. The hip joint that you were born with has a bony ball and this is your femur, the top of your thigh. During the surgery, the bony ball that you were born with is going to be removed and you will have a new ball and stem placed. So this is the top of your femur or your thigh bone. Your surgeon will make a little bit of room in the top of the shaft of the femur for this stem. The stem has a rough surface at the top of it and that's to help your bone really grow into and adhere to this implant. 
Your surgeon will tap this stem in place so it's firm and secure, and then move to the hip socket. The hip socket's fancy name is the acetabulum. Your doctor will use a tool called a reamer to make this socket nice and smooth and ready to accept this cup. The cup has a bumpy surface to it as well, again, so that your bone will really grow into and adhere to this new hip socket. So your surgeon will tap a new hip socket in place and there will be a plastic polyethylene liner inside of the hip socket. That will keep the um, metal or ceramic piece of the ball from touching the metal of the hip socket. Your surgeon will choose what size ball, um, how thick of a liner, and, and the alignment of all of your new hip replacement pieces, and then close your incision. Most people need a joint replacement because theirs is worn out for one reason or another. A lot of times it's a form of arthritis, but there could be other conditions that cause damage to the hip or knee joint to a point that a replacement is considered. This class is for people who are having elective hip or knee replacement, and that means you're planning it ahead of time and on purpose. Sometimes there's a traumatic event like a hip fracture and the bone is broken in a place that makes it necessary for a hip replacement. But this is for people who have planned this in advance. At this stage, typically pain, swelling, and just not having the lifestyle that you want are real limiting factors in your life. And the joint replacement is intended to help improve your quality of life and decrease your pain and get you back to doing some of the things that you used to be able to do. One to two weeks before surgery, you're going to come to TriStar Hendersonville's Outpatient Center for a visit with a nurse. We call this pre-admission testing. At that visit, you're going to be given this joint replacement binder. This will be a really helpful resource throughout your recovery. All of the things that I'm talking about today will also be referenced in this book. They might just be in a different order than the way that I'm saying them now. So your nurse is gonna give you this binder. It's a good idea to bring a list of your medications to this visit. And you wanna include all of the over-the-counter medicines that you take as well so that the nurse can counsel you on what to continue taking and which things that you're gonna to wanna to stop taking before surgery. This is a good time to be thinking about someone who can be helpful to you after surgery. So identify somebody who can bring you home from the hospital, provide transportation to therapy appointments or to your follow-up doctor's appointment, someone who can go to the pharmacy to pick up your medications. If you have pets that need to be walked or cared for, someone who can help you with those things you will be able to get up and care for yourself and move around the home on your own, but it will be nice to have someone there to help fetch you things if you need them. The first time that you get in the shower, it's really helpful to have someone present to make sure that you can safely step in and out of the shower or in and out of the tub. But it's not necessary for your caregiver or your helper to be actually physically lifting you because you'll be able to rise from a chair and walk to the kitchen and get in and out of your bed. It's a good idea to stock up on groceries before you're having your joint replacement so that there's less errands that need to be run after surgery. In addition, if you can do some cleaning of your house and clearing of clutter, that's gonna be really helpful because when you leave us after joint replacement, you're going to be using a rolling walker. So you wanna be able to walk around your furniture without tripping hazards and to be able to maneuver um, just throughout your home. This slide shows a picture of some things in your house to be aware of. The little throw rugs that we like to keep in front of our kitchen sinks and bathroom sinks can sometimes be a tripping hazard. So if you can remove those little rugs and put them in a closet temporarily, that would be a good idea. Watch for electrical cords or cords to fans or laptops or space heaters that might be in the floor. 
It's helpful if you have a railing on your stairs, but we're gonna practice going up and down the stairs with whatever scenario you will encounter at home. It's not necessary to prepare a bedroom on the main level, but you might wanna be thoughtful your first few days home about what kinds of chairs you're choosing to sit in. A cushy sofa might be more difficult to get out of than a firm chair that has arms. So just be thinking about your favorite chair and if it would be helpful to put a pillow or cushion inside that might be easier to get up when you get home. It's really important in your first week or two home to be very careful and try to avoid falls. That's why we're spending some time talking about preparing your home and being extra cautious. We are able to make our patients feel pretty comfortable right away after surgery. And some of our patients get brave enough to try to take a few steps without the walker. But I want to encourage you to continue using your walker at home until your therapist or your doctor says that you don't need it anymore. And the reason for this is just to exercise caution and really try to avoid a fall. At the pre-admission testing visit with the nurse, your medicines will be reviewed and the nurse will tell you some medicines to stop taking before surgery and which ones you're able to continue. The nurse will write this down in the book for you so you know when to stop medicines. But in general, medications that can thin your blood are going to be stopped five days before surgery. So that is things like Aleve, Ibuprofen, Motrin, it's fine to continue taking Tylenol if you're having a lot of joint pain right before surgery. But your nurse will explain exactly what to continue taking and which medicines you need to stop. It's really important to stop smoking and nicotine use if you can before surgery. The reason for this is that smoking increases risk of heart attack, stroke, pneumonia, and respiratory failure after surgery. It would be ideal if you can stop smoking several weeks before surgery, but any day that you can abstain, even if it's just one or two days before surgery, will decrease your risk of complication. Smokefree.gov is a website that is helpful for tips. So just do the best you can and try to reduce or stop your use of smoking products or nicotine products. In addition, if you're diabetic, it's really important in this time period before surgery and after surgery to have as tight of blood sugar control as you can. It might be helpful to limit alcohol, which can bring your blood sugar up. One of the labs that will be drawn in your visit with the nurse is a hemoglobin A1C. And that's a test that tells us a three month history of your blood sugar. If your blood sugar has not been controlled, it's possible that your surgery will need to be delayed until your blood sugar is more controlled. And the reason for this is that uncontrolled blood sugar can increase complications, and we want you at your healthiest before you have this surgery. The night before surgery, you're going to shower with this special soap that is given to you at that pre-admission testing visit. Start by getting in the shower and washing your hair with your normal shampoo, wash your face with whatever you normally use, and wash your groin with whatever soap that you typically use. Then you're going to use about a quarter's worth of this soap in this sponge, and we're gonna provide the sponge as well. You're gonna get this sponge nice and soapy, and then start working from your neck down on a whole body wash. So you might need help to reach all the places in the back, but um, there's plenty of soap here if you need to add some extra to it, but you wanna scrub everywhere from the neck down, just not in the groin. You're gonna let this soap sit on your skin for about two minutes. So turn the water on the shower off, let the soap sit for two minutes, and then turn the water back on and rinse it off. This special soap will continue to work hours after you've used it. So don't wash with your regular soap after this. It's also a good idea to avoid shaving your legs right before you do this shower. It's okay to have prickly legs before this surgery. The reason we don't want you to shave with a razor is because if you get a nick or a cut in your skin, that can be like an invitation for bacteria. So just stop shaving a couple days before surgery. After you've finished with the shower, 
you'll put on a clean pair of pajamas and it's a nice idea to have a clean pair of bed sheets that you'll be getting into as well. The next morning you're going to repeat this process. If you don't want to wash your hair again that's fine but you want to wash with this soap again from the neck down before you come into the hospital for your surgery. When it's time to come into the hospital it's a good idea to pack your joint replacement manual again because we're going to be referencing this and referring to it during your stay. You'll want to bring a comfortable pair of shoes. We like to have something that has um, a back to the shoe and the toes covered that's a little bit supportive. You'll want to bring comfortable, loose-fitting clothing. That can be shorts, pajama pants, a gown, whatever feels comfortable to you. If you plan to stay the night and you want to bring your own pajamas to change into out of your hospital gown, that's fine. Just pack something comfortable that you'll be able to travel, travel home in. We have basic toiletries here at the hospital, but if you have a special face wash, you might want to pack that when you come. If you use a CPAP machine at home, please bring that with you as well because you might need that after surgery and it's already set up for you. If you've been prescribed this carbohydrate drink, you'll want to drink this at least two hours before surgery. It doesn't taste bad. It's a carbohydrate loaded beverage, kind of like a fancy uh, Gatorade or Powerade without as much sugar. The purpose of this is to help keep you hydrated before surgery. When you arrive to the hospital, it's easiest to park in the front of the hospital, come through the main entrance, and proceed down the hallway to same day surgery. The doors have a large green sign on them and when you get close to the doors they'll open up and you'll be in same day. There's no need to stop at registration. In the pre-operative room you'll have several people coming in and out of the room to help prepare you for surgery. He or she is going to use a set of these wipes. It has the same kind of material that the liquid soap you used before you came into the hospital but just in a more convenient wipe form so your nurse will help you with this in just the surgical area so around your hip or around your knee your nurse is also going to start an IV and the reason for the IV is we're going to give you an antibiotic before surgery starts your surgeon is going to come visit you before surgery and will mark the area of your surgery with his or her initials in a specific place so that everyone in the operating room can see that it's the right person and the right side and the right procedure. You'll have an opportunity to ask any last minute questions of your surgeon at that time and your doctor will let you know about how long the surgery is expected to last. That way your family knows how long to anticipate in the waiting room. You'll also meet your anesthesiologist who will explain how you will be kept comfortable and asleep during the surgery. When it's time to move you to the next location, you'll ride on the stretcher to an area called holding. For all patients, this is where the antibiotic is started. And for my total knee patients, this is where the nerve block happens. The nerve block is an injection that will be given to you in about the middle of your thigh. You'll be given medicine before this happens to help keep you relaxed. The purpose of the nerve block is to help reduce pain after surgery. It's a numbing type of medicine that's injected in your thigh and it lasts for 12 to 18 hours. The reason we do this is so you don't need to take as many medicines by mouth or by IV for pain after the surgery. But the location of the nerve block still allows you to, to move your leg and control your leg. So it's just something that we do extra for pain. And the reason this is only for the knee replacement patients and not the hips is just the structure of our nerves um, the nerves aren't available in a place where the physician can inject it above the hip site, but they are accessible above the knee location. After holding, you're going to be moved to the operating room, and that's where your procedure will start. I mentioned earlier that your surgeon will give you an estimate of how long to expect the procedure to last, and it can vary patient to patient. 
Your visitors and family will be updated in the waiting room with a television screen that we call a tracker board. It will have your first initial and your last initial and the tracker board will change as your location changes. So it might have your initial JB and say preoperative and then holding and then operating room and then recovery so that your friends and family know where you are in, in your procedure. We try to run everything right on time, but if there is a delay, we'll keep you informed and let you know when to expect your surgery to start. With every surgery, there are certain risks. One of the risks with a surgery or a joint replacement is a blood clot, and the medical term for blood clot is deep vein thrombosis, or DVT. Another name for a type of blood clot that you could get after surgery is pulmonary embolism, or PE, is the abbreviation. We're going to watch a video here in a second that will explain what those complications are. There's a low risk for these complications, but the reason that we talk about it is the window where these could occur is about 14 days, and you're not with us for 14 days. Now these conditions are most likely to occur when you're here with us under our watchful eyes immediately after surgery. So we are monitoring you very closely right after surgery while there's an opportunity for these conditions to occur. But every hour out of surgery, your risk for these conditions gets lower and lower and lower. The reason we talk about it is we want you to know what to look for when you've left us and how to react if you notice a sign or a symptom of one of these conditions. The next thing is blood loss. Blood loss happens with all surgeries. It can happen a little bit more with the bone surgery than some other types of surgeries. But one of the things that you will really benefit from is advancement in surgical tools and in medications that help to limit blood loss. We use a medication called tranexamic acid, the abbreviation is TXA, during the surgery, and that really drastically reduces blood loss. And that means you'll feel better sooner after surgery than people did 10 or 20 years ago. In addition, the tools that are used in the operating room now are more sophisticated than they used to be and can help control and limit bleeding during the procedure. All of that means that you're going to experience less blood loss than people did long ago, which really reduces the risk of needing a blood transfusion after surgery. The next thing is stiffness, persistent pain, and scar tissue. And these all speak to how your tissue heals or how your incision heals. And the best thing that you can do is follow your physician and therapist's advice on how to care for your incision after surgery and what therapy or exercises to do while your incision is healing. So you're gonna be given some exercises to do after surgery and it's really important that you do those until your doctor tells you you don't need to anymore. The next thing is an issue with anesthesia. And the most common issue with anesthesia is nausea or vomiting. We're gonna give you medication before the surgery starts to try to prevent this altogether, but there's still a chance that you might have an upset stomach, a little bit of dizziness, or perhaps an episode of vomiting after the surgery. These are usually things that come and go pretty quickly, and we try to limit limit them by giving you medicine before and after surgery, but sometimes it still happens with the, with the medicine that we use to keep you comfortable during surgery. Sometimes after surgery, your oxygen level could drop. We are monitoring this with a probe on your finger that will alert us if your oxygen level does drop so that we can give you supplemental oxygen until your oxygen level has returned to normal. The last thing is underlying medical complications. You might have a condition like high blood pressure that is very controlled with a pill that you take. Or you might be diabetic and your blood sugar is very well controlled. Sometimes the stress of a surgery, like a joint replacement, can cause these typical stable conditions to be a little unstable temporarily. We are monitoring you for all of those conditions so that we can intervene if necessary. 
Less likely complications with this procedure is damage to blood vessels or nerves, problems with that incision healing, infection, or death. While this is a big procedure, I just want you to know that we take care of people who have total joint replacement every single week. So it is routine for our nurses and staff and physicians to care for joint replacement patients every week. Next, we're gonna talk about DVT or the blood clot and I have a video that will help explain this a little bit better. If you are immobile for an extended period of time because of surgery, pregnancy, illness, or travel, you may be at risk for deep vein thrombosis, or DVT, a condition where a blood clot forms in a deep vein in the body, typically the leg. Unlike arteries, which rely on the heart to force blood through them, veins transport blood with the help of muscle contractions while you move and walk. Veins also have valves that keep blood from flowing backward and pooling in your arms and legs. When you are immobile for an extended period, your venous circulation slows down. As a result, clotting factors in the blood may cause the slow-moving blood to clump together, forming a blood clot or thrombus. This condition is called deep vein thrombosis, or DVT. Common symptoms of DVT include swelling of the leg or a vein in the leg, pain or tenderness in the area, increased warmth in the skin, and red or discolored skin. In some DVT cases, a blood clot may detach from a deep vein and join the bloodstream. The clot travels from the deep veins of the leg, through the veins of the abdomen, into the heart, and finally lodges in the pulmonary artery or its branches, blocking blood flow to the lungs. This condition, called pulmonary embolism, is very serious and may permanently damage a portion of the lung. If a clot is large or if there are many clots, pulmonary embolism may also cause death. If you experience symptoms of PE, please tell your doctor or nurse immediately. These symptoms may include shortness of breath, a sudden sharp pain in the chest, a feeling of lightheadedness or dizziness, rapid or irregular heartbeat, or coughing that produces blood. To help prevent deep vein thrombosis and pulmonary embolism, your doctor may require you to do the following. Walk around periodically to keep the blood from pooling in your legs. Wear compression stockings and take anti-clotting medication. Let's talk about the symptoms of DVT or deep vein thrombosis. There can be more than one symptom, but the most common symptom is a large amount of swelling. Your leg might be double the size of your other leg. So you're looking for a profound amount of swelling. There could be other symptoms as well, like a change in color where your leg is a little bit more pink or more red. It is usually tender or sore, particularly behind the calf, in the meaty part of your calf. You could also have a little bit of warmth in the leg. Our nurses are assessing you for any change in your condition frequently while you're here with us. At first, they're monitoring you for this every hour, and as your time out of the operating room grows longer, they will start monitoring you for this every four hours. Even if you've had a hip replacement, the symptoms of a DVT are going to be further down your leg near your calf or shin area. The pulmonary embolism is a more rare but more serious condition. And when I say more rare, the likelihood of this after a joint replacement is less than half a percent. But if you have these symptoms, they're serious and you want to get medical attention right away. So the symptoms of a pulmonary embolism are severe and sudden shortness of breath, a severe chest pain. Patients have described it to me as a crushing sensation or like an elephant sitting on your chest. So it's not vague and it doesn't just come and go. Other possible symptoms 
are profuse sweating, profuse dizziness, collapse, or coughing up blood. Anytime you're having these type of symptoms, you wanna to get to the emergency room right away for treatment. I know all of those things sound really scary, but we're going to do a lot of things to reduce your risk. And the first thing that we're gonna do is get you moving really quickly after surgery. This has been a big change in the care of joint replacement patients over the last 10 years. It used to be that we felt that after surgery, you needed to rest. So we didn't really get you up and moving until the day after surgery. But research has shown us that early mobility, meaning getting you up and out of that bed as soon as possible, will really reduce your risk of these conditions. For that reason, we're going to get you up on your feet as soon as an hour after surgery. So early mobility has been a big change in how we care for joint replacement patients. Some other things that we will recommend you do is not sit for real long periods of time. This isn't something that you need to time or worry about, but it does mean that your recovery should be active. We don't want you to go home and sit in your favorite chair for hours and hours at a time watching television. It's important to get up and walk every hour or two that you're awake those first few days just to keep moving. If you're having a lot of swelling, elevating your legs can be helpful and you may want to change positions often. So propping them up on a footstool or in a recliner and then setting your feet back down for a little while. In the early period after your surgery, you will have a leg sleeve like this attached to both of your calves or a foot pump like this attached to your feet. Both of these devices are going to gently squeeze your foot or lower leg and help with the circulation in your circulatory system. Lastly, everyone is going to be prescribed a blood thinner after surgery. There's a variety of medications that your doctor might choose to order as a blood thinner. A common one is aspirin. So what I want you to know about aspirin is you're not taking it for pain. You want to take the medicine, whatever is prescribed, for as long as your doctor has prescribed it. If you're having any issues with the medication, it's really important that you contact your doctor and let him or her know so that they can change the medication if they need to. But everybody needs to be on some type of a blood thinner for several weeks after surgery to help reduce your risk of developing a blood clot. Infection is something that could occur with any surgery. And what we mean when we say infection is a surgical site infection. So an infection at that new knee joint or at the new hip joint. This is a rare condition, but the symptoms are not present when you're with us in the hospital. These can take several weeks before they're noticeable. And this will be in your discharge paperwork. It's also in the book. And it's really the primary reason that you see your doctor in person a few weeks after surgery. The symptoms that you're looking for are redness, pain, drainage, and fever. A little bit of pinkness in, around your incision is normal. The reason for that is your body is increasing the circulation to the area of your incision. What's not normal is for that area to start getting darker and spread out. So if you start to have an area that at first was just slightly pink and starts to get darker, more red, or grow in area, you need to contact your doctor and let them know. Pain is a normal part of this surgery, but each day should be getting a little bit better and a little bit better. If for some reason your pain starts to increase day after day, then that is a sign that something could be awry. So let your doctor know about that. Drainage is normal after this surgery for the first 24 hours or so. But if you go home and have any kind of fluid leaking from your incision area, that's something that you should contact your doctor about. And if you develop a fever of over 101.5, you also wanna let your doctor know so that your surgeon can make sure it's not related to the total joint replacement. We're gonna do everything we can to prevent this complication for you. 
one of the things we're going to be really diligent about is cleaning our hands before we come into your room or before we work with you. And you should do the same as well. Antibiotics will be given to you through an IV before your surgery. And then your surgical area will be cleaned once again in the operating room before the surgery begins. Your incision will have some type of bandage or covering over top of it. After surgery, you'll spend some time in the recovery room. We call it the PACU, which stands for Post Anesthesia Care Unit. You'll be in this area for 30 minutes to an hour after surgery with a nurse right by your side. And at this time, we're monitoring your vital signs really closely. We're checking your incision for drainage. We're giving you pain medicine in this area if you're having pain at the time. The nurse will instruct you in some breathing exercises and coughing, and this helps to get some of the anesthesia out of your system. And the nurse will also instruct you in ankle pumps, which is just moving your foot back and forth to start some of that mobility. You may not have good feeling of your legs at this time, but don't worry, it will come back. After your vital signs are stable, the nurse is going to take you up to our second floor on a stretcher where all of our total joint replacement patients recover. Even if you're leaving us on the day of surgery, you're gonna go up to the second floor so that we can spend a little bit of extra time with you and do therapy, making sure that you're safe to leave us. If you are awake and feeling well enough, the nurse will help you move from the stretcher and walk with the walker to your bed. It's about 15 feet from the hallway to the bed, and most of our patients are able to get on their feet and walk safely to the bed at this time. If you're not feeling well, or you don't have full sensation in your legs, we'll just help you move from the stretcher to the bed, and a therapist will come and visit you in about an hour. Once you're on the second floor, you're going to encounter some equipment that you may not have seen before. The first thing is the sequential compression device. That's what I showed earlier that fits on your lower leg or your foot that will squeeze your legs. The next is a surgical dressing or bandage. There'll be some type of covering over your incision. We'll also use ice packs over your incision area to help control pain and swelling. There will be an IV pole next to your bed. And the reason for that is you may need some fluids after surgery to help you feel better and to help your blood pressure become more normal. There will also be a machine next to your bed that will take your vital signs on a routine schedule. And the last thing is a probe on your finger that helps monitor the oxygen level that's circulating in your blood. One thing you might be thinking about is a Foley catheter. That's the tube that drains your bladder. Typically, our patients do not have a Foley catheter. That means when you feel the urge to go to the bathroom, you'll need to call the nurse who will help you use a walker and walk to the bathroom to do that. This surgery is going to cause some pain, and we are going to be asking you while you're with us on a scale of zero to 10, zero being no pain, and 10 being the worst imaginable, how much pain are you having? And the reason that we're asking you this is that the medication that's ordered for you varies based on your pain. If you're having a pain level of two or three, the medicine that's ordered for you is different than if you're having a pain level at a five or at a seven or at a 10. There's no right or wrong answer, but the reason that we change medications based on your pain level is we want to give you the least amount of opioids or narcotics as it takes to do the job. We want your pain to be at a tolerable level with the least amount of medicine. Your medicine is ordered every six hours, so be sure to ask for something for pain if you're experiencing pain. You might think six hours sounds like a long time to go in between pain medications, but you're getting other medicines that are helping with your pain that are not narcotics. Things like Tylenol or anti-inflammatories you'll be getting on a scheduled basis that will help with your pain. If what we're doing isn't effective for you, we'll call the doctor and see if there's something else that we should try. Our goal is for you to have a tolerable pain level 
not necessarily for you to have no pain at all because this surgery is a big surgery that, that does cause some pain. One of the side effects to pain medicine is constipation. If you're prone to constipation, it's a good idea to try to stay ahead of this symptom. One of the best things that you can do is drink plenty of water. You can also eat foods that are high in fiber and consider an over-the-counter stool softener. There's also fiber supplements that you can add to your water like Metamucil and just keep moving. Walking around will help to get your bowels moving again. This is an example of some high fiber foods. You might think about prunes being for constipation, but there's actually several other foods that you could consider adding to your diet that will help prevent constipation. Things like avocado, black beans, raspberries or blackberries. Some of those things might be helpful for you to eat after surgery. After surgery, you'll have several people helping to care for you. You'll have a nurse, a nurse tech, a physical therapist, an occupational therapist, and a case manager. The case manager's job is to help arrange any equipment that you need after surgery and to make sure that you know when your follow-up appointment is with your doctor and when and where you're going for therapy. The occupational therapist will come and discuss home safety with you, as well as techniques to help getting dressed and help with bathing when you get home. This is a long-handled shoehorn that can help with getting your shoes on if it's difficult to bend forward all the way. This is a long-handled sponge, which can help with showering if you can't reach everything. This is a reacher or a grabber, and this can help you pick up things off the floor if you don't have the balance to bend over all the way. This is a sock aid. Your therapist is going to hand you a pair of socks and see if you have the flexibility and the mobility to bend over and put your socks on on your own. And if you can't reach all the way to your feet, your therapist will show you how to put a sock on this tool and get it on so that you can dress yourself. You're going to meet your physical therapist right after your surgery is complete. And your therapist is going to show you how to get in and out of the bed, how to rise from a chair, how to safely walk with a walker, and what exercises to do after surgery. If you'll refer to the recovery section of your total joint replacement manual, there's pictures for the total knee replacement routine and the total hip replacement routine. If you can start these now before your surgery, that would be helpful. But your therapist will go over each of these exercises when they see you after surgery. After surgery, everyone is going to need a walker. And the type that we prefer is the type with two wheels on the front. The reason for this is you can walk kind of like you're pushing a grocery cart with a fairly normal gait or a normal walk. If you use a walker that doesn't have wheels, you need to pick it up and then take a step and a step. And that's not the normal way to walk. We want to help you get back to normal walking as soon as possible. Some people may like to use a rollator walker. And that's the type of walker that has four wheels, a seat that folds down, and handbrakes. And that might seem like a great idea, but after joint replacement, this type of walker is just too mobile. So we're really going to prefer you to use the type of walker with just two wheels on the front. It provides just the right amount of mobility with the stability that you need after surgery to help keep you safe and on your feet. After hip or knee replacement, some of our patients will leave us the same day and some of our patients will stay overnight and leave the next day or the day after. That depends on how you're doing and what you've discussed with your doctor. All of our total knee patients will need therapy after surgery. Many of our patients are able to go home and write to an outpatient therapy clinic. That's the type of place that you would visit just like you would a doctor's office. The reason this is our preference, if it's safe enough for you to do so, is that getting in and out of the house in and out of the car and back into the community is therapeutic in itself. So if you have transportation and you can safely make it to a therapy clinic, that's the best place to start your therapy. It's not appropriate for all of our patients. 
Some of our patients might need home health for a week or two where a therapist comes to visit you at the house until you're able to safely get in and out of the home and in and out of the car. If you've had both knees replaced and we're concerned about your safety getting in and out of the house, it might be necessary to have a very short rehab stay, five to seven days until you can safely do these things. Your surgeon will discuss this option with you because your surgeon will be the one to order therapy in whatever location is most appropriate for you. Everyone is going to leave us with a prescription for something for pain and some type of blood thinner. There's probably more things prescribed for you than those two, but make sure that you understand what you're taking for pain and how you should take it and what you're taking for your blood thinner and how you should take that. You will have equipment delivered here to the hospital if you don't already own a rolling walker. And we'll let you know when your follow-up appointment is with your doctor. Expect that to take place between two and four weeks after surgery. It's really important that you keep that appointment so that your surgeon can see you and follow up after the surgery to check on you. The nurse will also explain when you can shower. Most of our patients will be able to go home and shower that day. Your nurse will let you know if there's anything that you need to do in terms of care for your incision. But most of our dressings or coverings on the incision are able to get wet. Just don't sit in a tub or swimming pool, but you're able to take a shower and get it wet. After you leave the hospital, be really diligent about washing your hands. Manage your swelling. This can be trial and error. Some people are more prone to swelling than others. If you notice you're having a lot of swelling, you might need to relax a little bit more and sit down a little bit more often. It is possible to overdo it when you get home. The first few days, you might wanna limit time on your feet to about 15 minutes of every hour. And if you're not having too much discomfort or too much swelling, then slowly increase your activity. Stiffness is really normal. And the stiffness is going to last a lot longer than your pain. This doesn't mean there's anything wrong with your joint replacement. So just be prepared for there to be stiffness. Take short walks. This can help with the stiffness. Eventually it will get better. Use those ice packs. So apply ice to your area of incision or pain for about 20 minutes and then take it off. And you can do this on and off throughout the day. Balance activity and rest. And if you have any questions or concerns, please call your surgeon or you can call us back at the hospital. We're here 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So if you have a question or a concern and it's midnight, feel free to call us first and we can help you decide if it's time to call the surgeon or even call the surgeon on your behalf. If there's anything that you have questions or concerns about, please feel free to call the number below. Good nutrition is really important in your recovery, and it is a good idea to start even before your surgery with good portion control and a well-balanced diet. In particular, if you can try to get some extra protein or iron in your diet before and after surgery, that can make you feel a little bit better quicker. So we've included some food sources of both protein and iron. You can also use protein drinks or protein bars that are really easily found in your grocery store. Keep doing those exercises that your therapist has given you until your doctor says that you don't need to do them anymore. This joint replacement is really an active recovery and your part starts after surgery. So really keep doing those exercises. The American Heart Association wants everybody to get routine exercise five days a week up to 30 minutes a day as you can tolerate. So as you recover, if you can find an exercise that works for you, try to work this into your lifestyle. There are a lot of activities that are safe to do after a joint replacement. Some of the activities that are safe are swimming, water aerobics, walking, biking, tennis, and low impact aerobics. But this isn't all of the exercises that you can do, so be sure to talk to your doctor or therapist about something that's right for you. Walking is a really good exercise and all you need is a good pair of tennis shoes. It's a good idea to start on level ground and then work up to places that are a little bit hillier. Body Mass Index is a formula that uses your height and weight 
to let us know how much body fat you have. It's a good idea for your overall health to try to get your body mass index to a healthy point. So this will be part of your discharge paperwork. And as you recover, getting this to a healthy point will be just good for your overall health. For your overall health, having a good quality diet with fruits, vegetables, whole grains, lean meats, plenty of water, those are all good idea and good health practices in terms of diet and then slowly increasing your activity level as you're able to will help you get to a good BMI. You might find yourself able to do things that you haven't been able to do in a while. So let your therapist know what activities are important to you so that they can help you resume those activities. Alcohol can interact with your pain medicine, so be careful with using alcohol while you're taking pain medicine. If you can avoid tobacco and drug use, that will also help for a healthier lifestyle and a quicker recovery for you after joint replacement. If there's anything that you have questions or concerns about, please feel free to call the number below. From all of us at TriStar Hendersonville Medical Center, we are grateful that you've entrusted us with your care and we wish you the very best outcome with your new joint replacement. Thank you.